I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 5 and 6 today. Galatians chapter 5 and 6. I want to thank you for three things this morning. Uh, First of all, for allowing my wife and I to be here, to be with you. Um, It has been a privilege um, of inestimable value to us. So thank you for that. Number two, thank you for all the pieces, the the gifts that you gave to us, especially last night and throughout this week. uh, As we've heard you practice, as we've heard you sing, as we've heard you play. Last night was a special joy to us, and uh, thank you so much for that gift. I like to remind musicians that you are given a gift, and I thank you for that. The other thing that I want to thank you for is um, I like to encourage musicians, because every time I see a room packed with musicians like this, I think of David, who was a musician warrior. You are musician warriors, and I want to thank you for that. Perhaps you feel like, well, I'm a musician, but I'm not a warrior. Or perhaps you feel like I'm a warrior, but not a musician. But I I want you to understand, good warriors make good musicians, and good musicians make good warriors. So thank you for all those things this week. Um, As we come to Galatians, I love Galatians. This is going to be perhaps a little bit of an untypical chapel message in some ways, because I want to talk to you a little bit about my my journey with the Lord and His teaching me about one aspect uh, that has implications into all aspects of our lives. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit today. Now, to some people, when that word comes out, they're like, yes, I love talking about the Holy Spirit. There's other people that are like, oh, no, where is he going with this? Okay? And um, I I want to just kind of take you on a a three-point lesson because I, I tend to think in points, okay? I want to talk to you about the fact of the Holy Spirit today. Then I want to talk to you about... Um, the disappointment uh, that I had with spirituality. And then I want to talk to you about the discover, the discovery of biblical spirituality. So that's, that's where I'm going today. So you all know that that's the progress that I'm working through today. But I want to start with the fact of the Holy Spirit. Some of your traditions um, in, in your Bibles and in, in your Bible studies in your churches, some uh, emphasize the Holy Spirit in wonderful and grand ways. Other traditions tend to, to steer away from it, perhaps because of um, problems or issues that they've seen in the past. And so sometimes I think the doctrine or the teaching on the Holy Spirit is one of those doctrines that we kind of glance off of. We'll talk about God the Father, we'll talk about Christ the Son, and we'll talk about them with gusto, but many times we avoid this wonderful, precious gift that Jesus said to his disciples, I am going away, but I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will send my comforter to you, and he will be with you, and he will be in you, and he will remain in you forever. It was only about two weeks ago I was meeting with somebody in counseling and they're like, Pastor, I don't even know if I have the Holy Spirit. And and so my job at that point was to find out, well, do you have a relationship with the Lord? Do you, do you have, have you come to a place in your life where you've confessed Him as Lord, that you believe in, his, in your heart that God raised Him from the dead? And if you've done that, then the Bible speaks very specifically to this wonderful gift that we each have. So the fact of the Holy Spirit, let me just kind of bullet point it for you fairly quickly. Number one, Christ promised the Holy Spirit. Christ promised the Holy Spirit to those who are his. You can find that in John 14 and John 16. The Holy Spirit uh, does a number of different works in our lives, um, 
he gives us life. He instructs us in God's word. He convicts. He comforts. He dwells in us. He gives power or ability to do things. He leads us. These are all, and not all encompassing, but these are all things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And when Christ said, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, know that we go to God's word and we find out this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Now this is also very important to me, because this last um, year, this last semester, I've been teaching a church university uh, course at our church, and one of the things that we were asking the question of, or toward, was when Paul went from city to city in the New Testament, sharing the gospel, sometimes he was in a city for a very short amount of time. Do you realize that? I mean, sometimes when we think about establishing a church, it's going to be um, maybe a year or two years, maybe five years. Some of you are in a church that is, is just new and is 10 years old. Paul, when he would go to certain cities, he would share the gospel, he would teach people the Bible, and then because of persecution or other things, he would leave. And you know, I think that was a great burden on his life, except for one reason. Because as he would leave that city, he would have trained some people to teach and to encourage and, and share the gospel. And yet he would walk away from that city and then he would start writing letters to them. And if you read these letters with an understanding of, hey, sometimes these cities only had four weeks with Paul. Sometimes they only had a few months with Paul. And yet a solid church was established in which in which his expectation of them was huge. Look at 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He did not spend a huge amount of time, yet his expectation of them was so huge. But remember this, when he went to the, 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 the churches and established those churches, he did not hand out Bibles. But what he did ask, and we see this especially in, Ephes or excuse me, in Acts when he goes to the church at Ephesus, the first question he asks people who appear to be believers, he asks them this question, have you received the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and their answer is, um, we haven't even heard of him. He said, well, what did you hear about? Well, we heard the, the gospel according to John the Baptist. And he teaches them, and they receive the gospel, they believe, and they receive the Holy Ghost. So Christ promised it. The New Testament verifies it. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit being given at Pentecost. We see it being given at Samaria. Cornelius, the first, um, I shouldn't say the first Gentile convert, but um, the first one recorded in Acts, Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit. The, the Ephesians received the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 in verse 9 I think is also very important to us. I know I've already referred to Romans chapter 8, but Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Part of the reason I'm, I'm going after this today is, today is the last time that I have to, to be with you in chapel this year. And, and, and your counselors are, 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 are seeing the time running out for their time to be an influence and encouragement in your life. And some of you are feeling that same thing, and you're like, how can I keep on living the Christian life when I go home? And immediately somebody's going to say, well, you've got your Bible, right? Do you have a church to go to? I hope you do, okay? But having those things, one of the other gifts that you must not neglect is that Jesus Christ has given you his spirit. And so in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. For if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 13 and 14, once again, just factual teaching from the Bible. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel or the good news of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him 
with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. One of the greatest gifts that you have is the Holy Spirit in you if you have believed and received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That is the fact. Now, the reality, too, is many people view the Holy Spirit as um, kind of like the force. If you like Star Wars or something like that, it's like, may the force be with you. The Holy Spirit is not the force be with you type of thing. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ that dwells within us for eternity. John chapter 14. It is Jesus Christ's spirit. This is his spirit. It's the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit comes into us and he can be quenched. You can, you can quench him. You can throw water on him, if, if, if you will, in, in the figurative sense. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can resist the Holy Spirit. You can become apathetic to the Holy Spirit. And with that realization in mind... That's when I would go in my journey with the Lord to recognizing the disappointment with spirit, spirituality. Now, if, if I were to say to you, if I were to take a poll, and I'm not doing this right now with up to raised hands, please keep your hands down. But if I were to ask you, how many of you really want to be spiritual? Okay? I suspect I would get probably about 60% of you raising your hand, kind of scratching your head saying, what's the trick question behind this? There would be some of you who say, I don't really want to be spiritual because I know spiritual people and I do not want to be like them. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, there, there are different things that, that we use in our world that are not biblical, but they're uh, our litmus test for spirituality. It's like, okay, what way does this person dress? Oh, do they carry their Bible with them? How long have they been going to church? You know, I, one of the sad conversations I had uh, a long time ago in ministry was meeting with a couple who, who had, had been saved for five years, and, and they said, well, we're the babies in the church because we're five years old, and we're, we're the last people that got saved, came to know Christ in our church. But they felt like they were living in, up to the expectation of, we're the babies, and so we can do whatever we want because we haven't grown up yet. That is not the test of spirituality. But I've been looking, and I, I've been looking for years about how do I find somebody who's spiritual? What does it mean for me to be spiritual? Because listen, the church has a huge need for spiritually minded believers who follow Christ. But let's break the mold that is non unbiblical about what a spiritual person is. Okay, uh, let's break that mold. Obviously, it's not measured by your dress, the, the words that you say, what you carry in your hand. I remember being in college and learning of a pastor who had memorized basically the whole Old Testament. He, he was just gifted in memorization. And learning about that pastor, how he could be driving down the road on his way to commit a clearly immoral act. And he said, I was quoting scripture after scripture after scripture because I had it all memorized. So memorization of God's word, even though it is good and I would encourage you to do that, that is not a mark of your spirituality either. That might be a relief to some of you who thought it was. It's like, oh, whew, I don't have to be spiritual based on my memorization. Several years into my ministry in Maine, um, I had a good friend who was a fellow minister who um, uh, was um, cheating on his wife. And uh, my wife and I were devastated. It was one of those things that we would call rocking our world. Several years later, I learned about one of our missionaries um, uh, over in Ukraine who had been living a double life, and their wife had just found out about it. And about that same 
time period, another missionary that uh, we had relationships with over in Africa. Um, same type of scenario. And I started scratching my head because I looked at all these three people before I found this out. And this is what I, this is what I noticed about all of them. They were all high caliber people. Number two, they were high potency in ministry, meaning when they went to do ministry, they did a lot. I mean, I remember a young person from our church going over to Africa and coming back and is like, wow, that missionary is awesome. They don't even stop to eat. They just eat peanut butter to survive. And they're doing this and they're doing that. That's the person that I want to be. High caliber, high potential, high yield, high output people does not mean that you are spiritual. Well, another person that I came across, and I, I have a particular person in, in mind here, but I, I've seen it happen a number of places, the person who is a moralist. These are the people who portray themselves as morally righteous, while actually or actively condemning others who are not. Have you ever met somebody like that? Somebody that goes around and they're like morally righteous and it's like, uh, and, and then they see somebody that's doing something and they will be the first to point it out in that person's life. You know, it will be a complete stranger. You shouldn't be living like that. <laughs> oh, you should dress better. Oh, you know, how can you, how can you be a good citizen? And so, once again, I was just left with this disappointment, like, these people are not spiritual, so how do I find a spiritual person? How do we find a spiritual friend? How do we find a spiritual uh, uh, minister or mentor that we can come alongside and say, what is it that makes that person spiritual? This becomes even more um, unique in, in my sense because as a pastor, I'm looking for people to, to raise up in ministry and put forward. And, and sometimes I'm scared, like, what is there in that person's life that may not be good? <laughs> and then I have to look at myself. And I have to say, what makes me a spiritual person or not? Have you asked that question of yourself? What makes you a spiritual person? If we can get over that hurdle of all the, the wrong perceptions of spirituality, can you get to a point in your mind where you say, I really do want to be a spiritual person, but I'm still asking the same question, Pastor Lael, you're asking. How do I find if I'm a spiritual person? How do I discover it in another person. And, and really, you've got to start first and foremost with yourself and your relationship to God. And so this leads me then to the discovery of biblical spirituality. Now, I'm sure you can add to this discovery. I feel like I'm still in this process. But in Galatians chapter 5 and 6, we come across this discovery that I believe the Lord taught me and I have been testing it now for several years, and I feel like this is where you can evaluate yourself in regard to your spirituality. The discovery of biblical spirituality. In Galatians 5, we come across this, this whole theme of uh, the gospel and what it does. We come across the theme in the book of, of Christian liberty. And what I find very interesting throughout the Bible and throughout the New Testament specifically is Paul never asked anybody, are you saved? What Paul did ask is, have you received the Holy Spirit? In fact, if you look at Galatians chapter 3, in verse 2 it says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive... The spirit by works of the law or by the hearing with faith. You see, Paul is associating the idea of salvation with receiving the Holy Spirit. You don't get saved without having the Holy Spirit. You don't receive the gospel message, Jesus Christ, without receiving his spirit. 
But then we come over to chapter 5, and, and, and he talks about all these wonderful things. And I, I just, I want you to kind of zero in on verse 16. And it says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Now, we should define spirituality at this point. And here's a simple definition for spirituality. Spirituality is one who is guided in his life by the Holy Spirit. It has the idea of pertaining to the work of the Holy Spirit. Most of the time we come across this word spiritual in the New Testament. It, re, it, re, it regards to things that are uh, pertaining to the work of the Holy Spirit. Whether it be singing, spiritual songs, okay? Um, uh, but here we come to the idea of spirituality being driven... By the Holy Spirit's active work in those who call on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, Pastor Lael, I see the Holy Spirit here, but I don't see that term spirituality. Understand this in the Bible. When the Bible was written, especially the New Testament, there were not chapters and verses. That came in like 13 and 1400, okay? Okay. So these were letters that were written, and we've kind of chopped them up a little bit so we can remember and identify and find passages easier. But in chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So immediately, I'm, I'm, I'm relieved when I read that verse, because there is actually something about being a spiritual person. Because Paul says, the church needs spiritual people to restore those who are caught in trespasses, in sins. But to do it in such a way that is only driven by a spiritual person. So... So let's go back now to verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. I want you to see the contrast because we are all tempted to live in the flesh. Even Paul, in Romans chapter 7, he says, there's this great battle that I have between my flesh and my spirit. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, and this is what he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So then, with the mind, I choose the law of God. But it is the very next verse in Romans 8, 1, that we looked at earlier this week that says, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Listen, we all wrestle. We all wrestle between our flesh and our spirit. But I want to I point out one other thing about wrestling in the flesh, okay? <clears throat> Notice down in uh, verse 19, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And then there's this big long list, right? Perhaps you've read it before. Uh, the list goes immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And the temptation for us, because we like to live in the flesh is we go to this list and say, well, that doesn't identify me. Nope, I don't do that. Oh, well, the outbursts of anger come once in a while, but most of the time, I'm good, I'm chill, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. And yet, that's not the point of what he's saying here. Don't go to this list and say, well, I'm not doing any of those things, so I must be a spiritual person. That is not what he's saying. He's actually saying, this list here is just evidence. Have you ever heard of a crime, okay? When you go to a court of law and you're convicted of a crime, there is evidence that points to the crime. The crime, if you would, in this passage, is living in the flesh. The evidence of living in the flesh is all those things listed. But the question is still, what makes a person spiritual? And so our next, our, our next thought would be, well, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to look at within yourself. But can I draw your attention 
as we close today to the true test of spirituality as I see it here in God's word. In verse 25 it says, if we live by the spirit, let us also walk or follow after, align our lives to or order ourselves into the spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, or envying one another. Verse 26 is easily passed over, but I think it is really the ultimate litmus test to find out if you are spiritual or not. It says, let us not become boastful. Some translations have that, let us not glory, let us not be be glorying in vain vanity. Uh, the idea behind that is vain glory, empty glory, truthless glory, shameful glory. So he says, let us not become glorying in things that have no value. And then he goes on challenging one another and envying one another. Those who live in the flesh will constantly constantly live by those two standards, challenging one another, envying one another. The word challenge there means to call to a contest. You know what, if, if I am going to go um, challenge somebody to a contest, normally I am thinking to myself, I probably can beat them. You see, the challenging one another, uh, as John Stott puts it, he says, Challenging one another has the idea of superiority. If I think I am better than somebody else, I'm going to prove it over and over and over. And so the moralist comes along and proves it over and over and over to other people that they are more moral than they are. The person who is highly productive convinces other people that they are highly productive by proving it over and over again. Look at what I'm doing compared to what you're doing. But the, the second one is just as devious in its um, ramifications, envying one another. Again, John Stott put, puts it this way. He says, a person who is envying another person as a characteristic in their life is a person who has an inferiority complex. Some of you may have a superiority complex here. Some of you may have an inferiority complex because of one primary reason. You determine your own value based on other people's value. You determine your own value based on other people's value. This is living in the flesh. This is what the world is constantly doing. This is how marketing works in our world. This is how sales works in our world. This is how people navigate themselves. My works are better than your works. Or if my works can never uh, amount to your works, then uh, you know what? I'm just a bad person. Listen, a spiritual person does not find their value in any other person but in the Lord Jesus Christ. A spiritual person recognizes that our value is not external, but internal. Because we have the Spirit of Christ living in us. And so when we read Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren, Chehi campers, counselors, faculty, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who find your value in Christ in you, the hope of glory... You who are spiritual, restore such a one. Because the person who has an attitude of superiority when they come across the person who has fallen into sin is going to be like, I could never do that. I'll never fall into a sin like that. Or, as I've seen so many times in the last 10 years, the attitude of inferiority. We put people up on pedestals and we say, Wow, that person must be an awesome spiritual leader. And then they reject the faith. They reject Jesus Christ. And we scratch our heads and we say, 
what happened. And if we approach our value based on their value, it throws us into a tailspin that we cannot seem to get out of. But when you recognize that God gave you his son's spirit, the Holy Spirit, and we are now valued because we have his spirit in us, we don't have to navigate this life anymore by looking at what that person has, does, or is. Because my value is not based on that. My value is based on the value that Christ gave me. Your value is based on Christ in you. That's where it all starts from. Let's be spiritual. Let's want to be spiritual. And let's put aside the attitude of superiority and inferiority so that we can serve him wholeheartedly, restoring those who fall into sin, watching out for our own selves, lest we also be tempted and not seeking to find glory in useless things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the stay given to your people and for those who are here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that the desire to have the Holy Spirit and to have their value based in you from now on would prompt them to talk to their counselor, their teacher, their friend today and get that settled. In Jesus' name, amen.